I'm really excited to be here today. Like uh, they said earlier, my name's Alexandra Shepard. I'm the author of Oh My Gods. Oh My Gods is my debut novel. It came out earlier this year. Um, and I'm super excited it's out because it took me five years to write. So I'm just happy it's out and on the shelves and in the hands of young readers. But I'm also happy because it's about one of my favorite subjects, and that's Greek mythology. Now, I never studied Greek mythology formally in classics or in schools. I just loved reading about it. Anyone ever seen Disney's Hercules movie? Yeah? I think it's a highly underrated part of the Disney canon, in my opinion. Amazing soundtrack. Can't believe it came out nearly 20 years ago. Um, when it came out, I made my dad take me to see it three times because I was so obsessed with it. And that film really cemented a love of Greek mythology for me. Later on, when I became a teenager, I fell in love with the Percy Jackson series. Again, any Percy Jackson fans around? Yeah, brilliant. And when I was writing Oh My Gods, which as you can imagine has a huge amount of Greek mythology to do with it, it never occurred to me that I was bringing history to life or looking into the past. I was just writing a story with characters I thought were really cool. So before I go into Greek mythology, I'd like to ask you guys a few questions. Um, anyone here sometimes turn in their homework late? Anyone here um, a fan of Rihanna? Yeah? <laughs> anyone here have a really annoying older brother or sister? That's standard, yeah? Okay. So a few of you have something in common with the main character in my book, Helen Thomas. Helen Thomas is 14, um, she lives in North London, she's half Jamaican, and in many ways, she is your normal teenager. But there's one thing you might not have in common with Helen, and that's that she's half ancient Greek goddess. Her dad is Zeus, king of the gods, her big sister is Aphrodite, goddess of beauty, and she's just moved in with her family into a big house in North London. So you can imagine why Helen is feeling a little bit app apprehensive, right? Her biggest problem before moving in with her Greek god family was trying to get her French homework in on time and making new friends at her new school. Now she's got to try and keep the identity of her parents under wraps. Not only that, they have immortal life, immortal, uh, superpowers, and never have a bad hair day. If you think having an annoying older sister is enough, then imagine if your older sister is Aphrodite, who has perfect skin, an incredible wardrobe, and never lets you borrow any of her shoes. I think that would be pretty awful. So before I get into it, I'd love to test your Greek knowledge just to get an idea of where you are. So if I could have, haven't got much time, so three Greek facts from you guys. It can be any fact about the Greek gods. It could be the name of a monster, the name of a myth, the name of a superhero, just anything you know about the Greek gods. I'd just love to hear about where you guys are at. Lots of hands up over here. Yeah? Poseidon was the god of the sea, fantastic. Anyone else, maybe from this section since I'm here? You must know something, yeah? Athena was the goddess of wisdom, fantastic. And then one more, come round here, yeah. Zeus, the god of lightning. Zeus, his symbol was a lightning bolt, but yeah, sure, Zeus, god of lightning. So you've named some amazing deities there, so okay. I know you guys know the major deities, that's fantastic. Um, and I've got another little quiz for you guys coming up. Because one thing I realized when I was writing my book and putting together presentations for school visits is that these stories were written thousands of years ago, yet they are still such a huge part of our Western culture. Um, and not just in the stories we tell. You know, we could cite Fluffy from Harry Potter, who was Cerberus, the three-headed dog from the underworld. I could talk about Percy Jackson and Disney and things like that. But in so many other ways, these myths have completely infiltrated our Western culture. So I'm going to show you a few images, and if you guys can tell me what they have to do with Greek mythology, that would be great. They're quite hard, so if you don't get it straight away, it's cool. So the Nike logo. What does Nike have to do with Greek mythology? Oh, lots of murmuring. I like it. Yeah? Absolutely. Nike was a Greek goddess of victory. Um, before I worked in, as an author, I worked in advertising. And I spent a lot of time working with brands, trying to divine their brand identity. Um, and one thing I can tell you is that brands put a lot of thought into their names, into their logos, into their taglines. Those three words, just do it, I can guarantee the agency that came up with that spent 
a lot of, got a lot of money for it, for those three words, just do it. Nike chose that name of the Greek goddess of victory on purpose. It was not by accident. And you can imagine why, right? Nike posits itself as a brand for athletes. And what do athletes want to do? Win. Next one. Starbucks logo. This is a bit trickier. What's the Starbucks logo got to do with Greek mythology? I'll come around here. Any ideas? You've got your hand up, yeah? The lady is an ancient creature, absolutely. What type of ancient creature? Someone said mermaid, not quite mermaid. Mermaids have one tail, this one has two. Yeah? See, not a sea nymph. Um, you guys are really close, but it's a siren. Oh, you guys know what a siren is? No. no. Okay, can anyone tell me what a siren is? Yeah? Yeah, so a siren is a type of mermaid. I could say they're quite evil. Um, they basically charm sailors with their songs and lure them to their death. Um, I have no idea why Starbucks would choose a siren as their logo. Sometimes I go on school visits and people ask, say, I ask uh, students this, and the students say, well, maybe si Starbucks want to lure people to their coffee shops. Um, that could be an idea. Maybe it just makes a pretty picture, but they have decided to choose this as their logo. One more. Now we have the Versace logo. So Versace is an Italian designer fashion house from Italy. Very expensive, luxurious brands. Can anyone tell me what's going on in their logo? Yeah? It's Medusa, absolutely. This is Medusa before she was turned into a demon. Who can tell me what Medusa's famous for? You can just shout it out because I know you guys know it. Snakes, yes, absolutely. But this is Medusa before she was turned into snakes. Because so you've noticed here, there's no snakes in this woman's hair. And the story behind this is that the Versace brother and sisters grew up, brother and sister pair, they grew up in uh, Italy just outside of Milan. And they used to play in the ruins of a temple when they were children. And this was on the mosaic of a temple. It was one of the examples of Greek myths finding their way into ancient Roman culture, which I don't know much about, but we just had a fantastic talk about that from Caroline. So I'm sure you should seek out her books if you want to know more. And they decided to use this symbol as their brand, and it's become this real aspirational symbol of luxury all over the world. So I think it's super interesting, and I could find so many more brands who are still doing this today. And it doesn't stop at brands, even the phrases we use every day. I always use the example of Achilles heel, which Caroline just used. We use that in everyday phrase. If I talk about someone having a Midas touch, what do I mean? Yeah? They destroy everything they touch. Absolutely, that could be one way of looking at it. It's King Midas, so everything he touched, he turns to gold. But it could also mean that you're really lucky in the world of business, for example. If everything you touch turns to gold, but obviously in the story, King Midas, I believe, touched his daughter and then she turned into a gold statue. So there's a real lesson there about being careful what you wish for, uh, not being greedy, that sort of thing. Because the Greeks loved their lessons in their ancient stories. Could also talk about words like Olympics and democracy and so many words from the world of science and medic medicine and technology that have their roots in ancient, Greek, that we st ancient Greece that we still use today. And I think that's really, really cool. So it's really no surprise that writers like myself, like Rick Riordan, who wrote Percy Jackson, like J.K. Rowling, who wrote Harry Potter, that we still continue to be inspired by these stories every single day. And it's no wonder that even though my book is set in London in 2018, I was inspired by the ancient world to create my story. So we've talked a bit about why myths are important to us. I think first and foremost, they're really entertaining, right? They're really fun, really compelling stories where, and I love them as well because even though I grew up religious, I loved the ancient world stories because the gods were messy, right? They were petty and mean and vain and capricious and didn't always do things the right way. And that made for really compelling characters. But for the ancient Greeks, uh, Myths had a much more important function than just 
messiness and entertainment, although that is a big part of it, they explained how the world worked. Because if you lived in the ancient world, something like the rising and setting of the sun or the changing of the seasons would feel like something huge that could only be explained by divine intervention, which is why we have that lovely story of Apollo, god of light, chasing, and his job being to chase the sun in his chariot every day, which explains why the sun rose and set. And we also have the story of Demeter and Persephone, which is my favorite myth. Can, does anyone know the story of Demeter and Persephone and how the seasons change? Yeah, a few of you. So I'll just explain it quickly. Um, Demeter was a goddess of the harvest, and her daughter Persephone was out innocently playing one day, no doubt, gathering flowers. Wasn't much else to do in ancient Greece. When she was stopped by Hades. Who was Hades? Can anyone tell me who Hades is? Go around here. Yeah? Oh, yeah, you. Um, I think, wasn't he the god of the underworld? Exactly. Nice big voice as well. Well done. Hades was the god of the underworld. The god of the underworld decided he wanted to take Persephone to be his wife because he was lonely in the underworld. Didn't ask her permission, of course, just took her. And, of course, Demeter was heartbroken. And when Demeter was heartbroken, bad things happened on Earth because Demeter is the goddess of the harvest. So what happens if the goddess of the harvest is upset? Yeah? There's no harvest. When there's no harvest, people die. When people die, the gods don't get their sacrifices, and that's when they started to pay attention. Not because they particularly cared about the lives of mortals or whether they lived or died, because the mortals, they lived in a blink of an eye compared to the gods. But they liked their sacrifices, so eventually they managed to intervene, and Zeus managed to persuade Hades to let Persephone out of the underworld except Persephone was tricked by Hades into eating something. And if you eat something while you're in the underworld, you have to stay there forever. Does anyone know what it was she was tricked into eating? Yeah, lots of hands. Yeah? Pomegranate seeds, yes. Six pomegranate seeds to be precise. So six months of the year, Persephone had to stay with Hades in the underworld. Six months of the year, she was allowed to be with her mother. And you can imagine what six months of the year Persephone was with her mother, right? Spring and summer. Persephone, Hades, uh, Demeter was happy because her daughter was by her side. She made things grow. The world flourished. And then during autumn and winter, when Persephone was in the underworld, that was when things didn't grow and you had to wait for the spring and summer to come back in order to survive. So I think it's really interesting and I love, that's what I loved about the myths and this isn't unique to Greek myths, myths all over the world cultures do this, right? They use these stories to explain how the world worked. And by looking at these myths, you can see the function of some of the Greeks and God, gods and goddesses and what they valued. Because as far as I'm concerned, I don't think you have to go to a museum and look at pottery shards and freezers and sculptures to learn about the ancient world and what they valued. You can look at their stories. You can look at the gods that they had, the heroes and what they did to learn what it is that they valued. And that's something that always stuck with me. So a few of you guys mentioned some of the functions of gods and goddesses. You mentioned Poseidon, god of sea, and Zeus, who's the king of the gods. Can any of you guys tell me a couple more gods and goddesses and what they've uh, functioned, what they've represented? Maybe someone hasn't spoken before, yeah? Ares, God of War. Ares, God of War, fantastic. Really, really important deity. One more. Yeah? Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty. So by looking at these deities, you can see what it is that they represented. And when I was writing Oh My Gods, I had a really fun job, which was how can I take these ancient gods from the ancient world and bring them up to date? So I've already mentioned that Aphrodite was a big character in my book. Aphrodite, goddess of beauty. What might the goddess of beauty be doing if she was living in 21st century Britain? What might her job be? What would she be, how would she be spending her time? Yeah? Makeup artist, absolutely. Anything else? Yeah? Instagram model, absolutely. I could go on about this, but I haven't got much time. But I will say that in my book, I decided to make Aphrodite a makeup artist and um, at first, and then an Instagram influencer on YouTube. So she had a YouTube channel sharing her beauty tips. And of course, she has a huge wardrobe because that's what she loves. She loves and values beauty. Uh, another character in my book is Apollo, god of light, god of music. What might Apollo be doing in 21st century Britain? 
What would he be doing for a job? What might his hobby be? Come down here. Yes? Yeah. He might be a busker. Yeah, go in the streets and sing. Absolutely. Any other ideas? Might be a musician, all fantastic suggestions. So in my book, I decided to make Apollo a DJ. He could have been a music producer. He could have been an orchestra conductor, but he's a DJ. And because he's a god of light, god of the sun and values hot weather, he's a DJ in summer gigging in Ibiza. He would much rather be having much more attention on the global scene. But in my book, he has to keep his identity secret. So he can't show the world how good he is. And then finally, another big character in my book, Athena, goddess of wisdom. What might Athena, goddess of wisdom, be doing in 21st century Britain? Yeah. She could be a teacher, definitely. Sharing all that knowledge. Any other ideas? Yeah. Scientist, absolutely. In my book, I decided to make Athena a human rights lawyer because I know she was into justice and she was intelligent. And I needed to make one of the gods at least nice in my book. Um, sometimes I ask, some people ask me why I made Zeus nice in my book because Zeus was not a nice character. But, and the truth is, I write for teenagers. I can't be honest about all the bad things that Zeus got up to in the myths because that would make my book like an 18 plus and I write for a 12 plus. So <laughs> had to kind of tone it down a little bit. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you guys a question that's going to seem really, really obvious. But bear with me, it's going to all make sense. What are some of the big differences between our society right here today in Britain in the 21st century and the ancient Greeks 2,000 years ago? If an ancient Greek person somehow finds, found themselves in a time machine and landed here in the UK in 2019, what would they be most shocked or surprised by? Yeah? Electricity. Absolutely. Electricity is a huge one. And I think definitely one of the biggest things they'd be shocked by. What else? Pollution. pollution. Yeah, no one said that before. But I think pollution is a, is a good one. I don't know about the air quality in ancient Greece, but I'm sure it's better then than it was now. One more. Yeah. All the different religions. All the different religions, definitely. You might also have said skyscrapers, big buildings, traffic, lots and lots of different things. And you might also have said things that, like pollution and climate change once they got down to it. In any case, they'd be in for a shock. So when I was writing Oh My Gods, even though there are so many ways I could update the gods for the 21st century, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could invent a new set of deities for the 21st century to deal with our modern problems? We've talked about some of the things that the ancient Greeks valued, and we know that they value things like hunting, uh, poetry, Wine, they had a whole god dedicated to wine, um, music, that sort of thing. And we know they valued all of those things because they had whole gods dedicated to them. But what do we value? Is it any different? And if so, what gods would we have? So I, what I'd like for us to do today is to think a little bit about what gods we could create for the 21st century. And I'm not suggesting we then go out and build temples to these gods. If you want to, that's fine, that's on you. You do what you like in your spare time. What I am suggesting is that this exercise is really useful for figuring out what it is that we value. And I usually do this as part of a much longer creative writing workshop. And it's always really, really interesting to see the different gods and goddesses that people create. It's like an insight into what people value. So I'd like to give you guys a few examples, and then maybe you can come up with some of your own. And if you're brave enough to put up your hand and share it, that would be great. So anyone um, who here has their own smartphone? Yeah, lots of people have their own phone. Um, anyone used a meme on WhatsApp in the last 24 hours? Yep. There's that phrase, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. If a picture is worth a thousand words, then a meme is worth 50,000 words. You use a meme when a picture won't do. And when a meme just sometimes perfectly captures your emotion, I'm probably way too old to be using memes. I use them about three times a day because there's no better way to capture your emotions than a single picture, reaction picture. They're like a universally known language. And I truly believe that in 50 years time, people will be studying meme culture and how quickly it changes in universities. It's so fascinating. So if the ancient Greeks had a god of poetry because they valued that, why wouldn't we have a god of memes in the 21st century? 
Um, another thing, um, so I live in London and I rely on the tube quite a lot because I don't drive and it is a handy way to get around but sometimes it's also the bane of my life because commuting is hot, smelly and I'm in someone's armpit and I'm often late. Anyone here ever had a bus make them late for school or for work? Yeah? Public transport doesn't always run like it should. And if the ancient Greeks had a god of transport or travel, who was Hermes, god of travellers, who helped travellers on their way, why wouldn't we have a god of public transport in the 21st century? And what might that god of public transport help you with? Any ideas? Yeah? Getting there on time, absolutely. You'd never be late again. So you'd have to think of a new excuse for being late for school. What else? Um, making, sure tra making sure there aren't as many traffic accidents. Less traffic accidents, brilliant. I love that idea. One more, yeah. Allowing to make cars fly across so that it's easier to move and there won't be any traffic jams. Brilliant, I love the way you think. You can make cars fly across so there'll never be any traffic jams. Maybe the god of public transport would make your bus invisible to everyone except you, so you'd have a nice, smooth, easy ride to school or to work. Because the Greek gods didn't always act in ways that were noble and fair. They sometimes did things that were messy and complicated and weren't always very nice, and that's what makes them such compelling characters. And when I do this creative writing workshop, I always urge the people writing stories to think about ways in which they can make their modern gods just as messy and complicated and interesting and varied. Finally, I guess exams are going to be a big part of your life, if not now, then soon. What might a goddess of exams help you with? I'm down here. Oh, lots of hands. Brilliant. Yeah. Cheat on your test, yes. So I ask this question loads of times, and people are like, oh, maybe they could help you revise, or maybe they give you more time. It's like, no, they would help you cheat. Why wouldn't they help you cheat? They're gods, they can do what they like. And if they like you and they favour you, why wouldn't they? They could help you cheat, absolutely. What else could the goddess of exams help you with? Help you, help you deal with stress, absolutely. Calm you down. Maybe the goddess of exams could strike the invigilator down with chicken pox the night before so that you get some extra time to revise. Maybe the goddess of exams make ev makes everyone else in the room fail but you. It could always go in your way. And I love this exercise because it helps us to think about all the different things that we value. And if you guys were going to come up with your own god or goddess, what would you come up with? Has anyone got any ideas? I'll come down here. Oh, I'm so excited to hear your replies. Yeah. God of technology. God of technology. Fantastic. Absolutely. And what would the God of technology help you with? Definitely. Get better technology. What else? Yeah? God of fashion. What would the God of fashion help you with? Nice clothes. Definitely. I'll come down here. So we've got God of technology, God of fashion. I'm getting insight into what it is you guys value. If you at the back, do you want to shout? God of tea. God of tea? <laughs> I have had weirder gods. I've had someone say God of baguettes because they just really love tuna baguettes. That's fine as well. What else? Goddess of money. And I'm always surprised when more people don't say money, considering that money and wealth is such a huge depend uh, factor in your happiness. And we don't have much time. I'd love to go on and hear your ideas. You could go on for much, much longer. But I think this exercise is really fascinating as a way to help us think about how we've moved on also how things aren't that different because when I was writing oh my gods I didn't have to invent a new set of deities I felt like the ancient ones were just as complex and creative and interesting enough for me to update with a few tweaks and I'm not the first author to ever tweak their gods for the 21st century or to do the thing of gods on earth lots of other authors have done that I highly recommend a book called um, God's Behaving Badly by Marie Phillips, which is really fun. Again, God's in London. And you can see how they've been tweaked just ever so slightly to fit in. Um, these stories are absolutely timeless. And if any of you guys are thinking about being an author or being a creative writer, but you don't know where to start, just look to the past, look at these stories that have stood the test of time and think about how you can tweak them for your own purposes. Um, it's been really lovely speaking to you guys. Thank you very much for having me, and I really hope you all continue with this creative idea.